Well, the Tor network is used by all kinds of people all over the world. So it's sometimes used by people that wish to vi visit uh, censored websites, but it's also used by, in some cases, the police. So it's sort of hard to tell who's using it and what they're using it for, which is the entire idea. But effectively, the way that it works is that it, there's equal access for everyone. And when you use it, it's hard to tell what people are doing. And that's the design. So the design is that anonymity loves company, so we make sure there's a lot of people that are able to use the system. It's built with free software for freedom, and it uses strong cryptography, and it's decentralized. So it's not like a virtual private network or a VPN, where you send all your traffic to one person forever, and you hope that they don't give it up. It's rather that you communicate with thousands of computers all over the internet, and you try to compartmentalize the things you do, and you try to make sure that anyone that might know that you're here in Graz at the Elevate Festival would not know, for example, that you were visiting a website in Sweden or that you were trying to get around censorship that exists on a network somewhere. And basically, the way that this works um, in practice is in a web browser. So someone will just use this web browser we call the Tor browser. And without any configuration or setting any of that up, Whatever they do in that browser goes through Tor. And so we try to make it as easy as possible, but not easier, because we don't have time to do that all the time. Um, we're busy writing that software and coming to things like this. Well, I mean, everything has edges. So of course, if you like broke into the house of a developer and changed the source code and then told everyone there was a new update that they should download, like any software, we have these fundamental problems which are hard to solve. We try to solve these as best as is possible, and we do that also with cryptography. So we make sure that people download software that we have released, and we give them steps to verify that we have actually released it. We can't censor things on the Tor network because we don't look at those things. And we can't turn things over because we don't collect them. And in fact, we try to make sure that any one person or any one set of people could not do that. And that is, in fact, by design. And we call this privacy by design. Whereas the other design, a centralized system where you hope that someone won't put you into trouble or harm's way, well, that's what we would call privacy by policy, which comes down to trust. So if you happen to be a journalist and you're working on something that is really important, do you trust somebody you pay $5 a month for VPN service that's called Hide My Ass? Hmm. In this case, it might make sense to use a free service like Tor, and you'd recognize that at least you're compartmentalizing your risk. At least you have never exposed your identity to the Tor network. You've never given billing information. You've never done any of that stuff. The problem is not free speech. It is complicity with, rent, with, with, with genocide and racist ideology that actually manifests as real murder across Europe and across the world. And so the real solution to that is to not have right-wing cops helping right-wing murderers espousing Nazi ideology and not glorifying it and not pretending that terrorism is only terrorism when it's a Muslim. I've read some pretty disturbing things, such as that when people call about immigrants in Athens, that the police will give out the telephone number of the local Golden Dawn and say, these people will help you with your immigrant, immigrant problem. And then the Greek version of the brown shirts show up and beat up the immigrants and try to chase them out of Greece. So this kind of fascism is on the rise. And what we need is anonymity in order to protect us. And it is true that some of these oppressors will get anonymity as well. But I'm okay with that because it means everyone has it. And that, that is better than only the people in a position of privilege who are already abusing their privilege. It is better than, than it's just them that has this. And that, that to me is, I recognize, quite controversial. And in the US it's also controversial. But for every soldier that gets to have anonymity, I think there's a couple hundred peaceful protesters that also get anonymity and peace of mind. And that for me is a societal trade-off that I am very comfortable with because it's a place where we actually have some real equality and that equality can be the ground where we lay other equality out. Probably if you can avoid being on Facebook, 
I don't know why you wouldn't. I mean, it's cool to be there, but the unintended consequences of contributing to systems like that are not zero. And it's hard to measure them in real time, and it's really hard to measure them on a long scale. I mean, it's in some ways, accidentally or on purpose, the greatest, one of the greatest intelligence gathering operations ever. Can you imagine getting that many people all across the world to pass all of their communications and all of their relationship information and all of the things they do and all their location information that, 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 that this company can extract and all of their address books and all of this stuff? Can you imagine that if the CIA or the BND or the BSI or the BKA or whatever, you know, the MI5, if they release an app like that, like how many people would use it? Like I'm guessing probably not many. But Facebook did it, and they, of course, collaborate with all of those agencies that I just made. In some cases, the US government um, requires it by law. And so, of course, there's this question, which is, you know, would you have chosen to do it? And the answer is probably no for the obvious one, but for this one, you see some value in it. And there's a network effect. That is, if you don't use this site, then you, of course, don't have, well, you know, you don't get invited to the parties, you don't get invited to whatever your friends are doing, you don't see what's going on. I understand now that they are doing active policing of their Facebook chat related stuff. And I read an article about it, I don't know if it's true. So, I mean, I say this saying that I've heard this, I don't know how true it is. Um, that they're actually looking at it and they have machines that analyze it, this machine learning where they try to tell what people's behavior is. And then they try to determine that some illegal stuff has happened and they pass it to a human who then looks at the chat log and then, as I understand it, they can, in some cases, call the police. And that, to me, makes it less a joke to talk about it in terms of human data trafficking and, and, and Stasi book. Because, really, that's the case. You have these people who are analysts that are doing what an intelligence analyst would do, but it's privatized intelligence. And then they're calling the police based on their ethical and moral framework, which is almost certainly not ours, or certainly not mine. And we put all these things together, and um, boy, that really, I think, is gonna destroy a lot of people's lives. And I think that maybe that's not the way we wanna go, but I don't think that we should stop connecting to each other. What I think we need to do is see that we can change these things. We can restore the civil liberties and the freedoms that we used to have a hundred years ago, for example, and it'll be all right. And we can do that technologically, but it's mostly a social thing. And when we look at, say, the internet in terms of posting things, I think we should try to have a good etiquette about it. That is, it might not be a good idea to take pictures of people sometimes. And maybe conspicuous consumption is not the most awesome culture that we want to promote, where you know the only thing you get out of a, a meeting with a person is that you can share the picture later. That doesn't seem very genuine to me. It seems almost antisocial, in fact. For example, using off-the-record messaging and using um, Tor and the Tor browser, those are okay things for now, I think, but we can do a lot better. There are a whole bunch of services and, and software out there that are trying to move into this field um, things like um, ZRTP, which just rolls off the tongue, um, which is uh, part of a thing called Silent Circle, which is a new, it's a new thing that is sort of like Skype, except part of what they're saying is we can't and won't wiretap you. And, you know, totally secure voice and video calls within these parameters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in theory, I think that this could work out really well. We'll see. It's not free software, though, so it's very difficult to know if what they say is true or not. Well, I mean, the world ends every day for somebody, right? And uh, I think people learn the hard way, generally speaking. And collectively, people really learn the hard way, generally speaking. So, I don't know. I mean, the easy answer is to say yes. But it doesn't need to be the apocalypse that some people predict, like the one in the Christian Bible or something like that. But they need fundamental aspects of their worldview to be shattered for them to reconsider the assumptions that underpin them. And in some of the legal proceedings relating to WikiLeaks, for example, people used to say that none of these things would happen, there, were, there was no secret law, there is no government uh, persecution of political people in the U.S. or whatever. And of course, I never believe that to be true, 
but it was hard to convince people of these things until I started having it happen to me. And in a sense, when the trust in institutions starts to be undermined like that, when the government starts to lose legitimacy, or a government starts to lose legitimacy that way, that is kind of an apocalyptic thing, because the state is, if not one of, it is the most recognized idea as being valid from the 20th century, this notion of the state. And so we see with that, that as democracies start to lose credibility with their people and the people don't feel represented by them, that it is an apocalyptic event in a sense. And that is, I think, part of what has been shifting a lot of people's behavior. I think that that is part of what happened during the Arab Spring, right? I think that when Tunisia fell and Ben Ali was ousted, Egyptians said, hey, we're better than the Tunisians. If they can do it, why can't we? And so in a sense, it was an apocalyptic event for Ben Ali and the Tunisian regime. And that was part of what gave hope and inspiration to people who thought that the situation that they were in was unending and hopeless. And of course, they did the same. And it is still ongoing in Egypt. I think probably it doesn't have to be that way for some people because they study history or they have perspective that is afforded to them by some other aspect of privilege or hardship that, that they learn from. But it does seem to be the case that even though we said there would be no more holocausts in Europe, we saw what happened, for example, with Slobodan Milosevic. And we saw what has happened in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we see that otherwise good meaning and good and well-meaning people repeat history over and over and over again. And so I think many of those people the majority of them may need to have their world shattered about major things so that they might under, understand and then reconsider their core assumptions and uh, hopefully try to do something differently from a set of ethical and moral principles.